Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us. We'll give it just a few moments for everyone to get comfortable and join us in the virtual meeting room. Welcome everyone. We're just giving it a few moments for everyone to get comfortable. Thank you for joining us today. All right, good afternoon, good morning, good evening all. My name is Janine Tunis and I'm part of UN Habitat's Open Mobility Team. We're very excited to have you here today with us, but before we dive into today's activities, I'm going to do just a few small housekeeping notices. The first one is that we are very fortunate to have this session translated into both Portuguese and French today. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to toggle between Portuguese, French, and English. So if you're hearing me in a language that is not familiar, um, I can also type that in the chat so that you can see where to find the relevant language tools. Then the second element is that we've decided to keep this meeting as a meeting and not a webinar. So it's a very conversational space and you are welcome to share information in the chat, introduce yourselves, and also most importantly, I think, make sure that when you are named, you are named as yourself and your organization so that we can ease communication in the session and enable people to speak when they have inputs to give. Another important thing to understand for our presenters specifically is that she, screen sharing will be enabled on the go, so you will be able to request screen share and it will be enabled by administrators at ITDP. Thank you to the team in the background, they're doing the hard work to make sure everything runs smoothly. All right, on that note then, I will start by saying that we are incredibly excited to be implementing this project supported by the United Nations Road Safety Fund as we move into this decade of action. The safe systems approach is going to be integrated into every component of this work. And if we are successful, which we very much believe we will be as there is so much interest and momentum for building back better and ensuring road safety during and post the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that the future is bright and we can save potentially up to 5 million lives in the next 10 years or so in the lead up to 2030. Before we get into the wider activities, I'd like to invite the chief of our section to give some opening remarks. Andre Jikas, thank you so much for joining us. I'll hand over to you for some opening remarks on behalf of you and Habitat. Thanks, Thanks Janine. Hi, colleagues. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very happy that we're coming here together on this uh, session to launch this project on road safety. And we're very happy to really continue with this collaboration on road safety um, and safer mobility here in Africa. And this is, of course, uh, great that this is also a continuation of a previous uh, project, um, which we did with the UN Road Safety Fund and ITDP in Ethiopia uh, on uh, scaling up safer street design in uh, Ethiopia. And uh, we're very happy um, that we could really achieve some great successes in Ethiopia. And I think really Ethiopia did a great job in this area. And amongst the things which were achieved that a non-motorized national strategy was launched and also developed and also nationwide design guidelines were drafted and put out um, within uh, part citizen participation on, on road safety. So this is really great. And UN Habitat has over the years been working with some 20 countries to improve road safety 
and equitable access to safe transport and efficient transport, and of course, also reducing pollution in cities. And we're very happy that with this new um, batch of funding from the Road Safety Trust Fund, we can continue working in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, uh, in Kenya, and also in Mozambique and also in Guinea. And we're also very happy about all the partners who are joining on this program, who are ITDP, UNICEF, uh, UNECE, UNEP, uh, just to mention some of them who are joining forces on, on this program. <clears throat> Uh, this program, which we're looking at, is really focusing on SDG 3.6 at halving the number of the global deaths and injuries from road traffic accidents. And of course, SDG 11.2, which is to provide access to public transport um, while giving special uh, attention to, to vulnerable groups and sections of society, especially women, children, persons with disability, and also older persons. We're very much uh, looking forward to implementing the core components of this project, but also to strengthen the elements of this project with housing, with climate change, and also transport as a fundamental element of urban systems we're living in. And we're also looking at a very rapidly changing world with changing situations and consequences of climate change. Uh, global pandemics, but also more unforeseen events which are happening and unfolding uh, as we're here at the moment. And uh, what we've seen is that um, the COVID pandemic has really put an additional burden on cities and their transport systems, but it's also got cities to focus more on transport city uh, systems, looking at safer public transport systems. What we've also seen was an increase in, in walking and cycling in cities and also um, investments into more public transport systems. And of course, also the discussion around uh, uh, clean air coming from reduced transport emissions um, and also better planning in cities for, for transport and, and having closer neighborhoods, speaking about the 20 minute city uh, where everything is approachable. <clears throat> We're very much looking forward in, in forging partnerships with cities and to, to promote this work and move forward this work. And I'm very happy that we've got colleagues here from all the different countries pre uh, present and all the countries which are joining in this project. And I very much look forward to listening in and learning from all of you how we're going to carry this um, project forward. So with this, I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and then hope uh, hand over back to Janine. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Andre. Appreciate appreciate your inputs there. Apologies, some technical. There we are. Thank you so much, Andre. Appreciate your inputs there as always. I would like to now share a video with you that was submitted by Jean Tot, the special envoy of the Human Road Safety Fund. And um, he has some words for us on this project and our activities. African cities will gain over 900 million new residents by 2050. This makes Africa the fastest region for urbanization in the world. Rapid growth brings an ever increasing demand for transport and access to essential services and opportunities. The unfortunate reality is that infrastructure and service provisions often cannot keep pace and often fails to meet the urgent needs of vulnerable road users, particularly children. Africa is the worst performing continent in terms of road traffic fatality rates, with numbers steadily rising. According to the World Health Organization, it also accounts for the highest mortality rate in terms of pedestrian and cyclists, with 44% of the overall deaths. Many cities on the continent are faced with traffic congestions, road accidents, harmful emissions, 
and unsafe streets for children. Car-oriented transportation policies tend to raise inequity, as those who are without a car must still walk on roads that are not designed to be safe for all road users. In this context, the promotion of walking and cycling and infrastructure that protects them will produce significant social and environment benefits. We need low-speed streets where people can walk, live and play. We need safe food space on urban streets that lead us to place of work, education and opportunity, and then back home again. We need protected crossings and bicycle lanes. This is reality within reach. The good news is that cost-effective, locally appropriate and often innovative transport solutions for improving the conditions for pedestrians and cyclists are increasingly available and promoted. We need to invest in these solutions. Good examples include the National Non-Motorized Transport Strategy, launched in 2020 in Ethiopia, the Street Design Manual for Urban Areas in Kenya, and the systematic and deliberate inclusion of walking and cycling in Rwanda's national transport policy. Not to mention the strong political willingness and support to better streets for pedestrians and cyclists from government in Mozambique and Guinea. This shows us that safe and healthy streets where spaces shared equally are possible. It shows us that the financing challenges can be overcome with robust frameworks, good street designs, data and coordination. The Reclaiming Streets projects come at an opportune time. COVID-19 has emphasized the importance of non-motorized transport. It has showed us that no matter what happens, we will always need to move and we will always need a safe and accessible means to do so. It created some momentum for people that walk and cycle. I'm inspired by the pilot project on active mobility such as Nairobi's pedestrian street, Lutuli Avenue and Kigali's effort to build sidewalks and cycle paths along new roads. And the increasing number of car-free days and pedestrian-centered initiative we see across the continent. We can see the safe system approach in action. We see steps being taken to deliver concrete outcomes to enhance road safety and lower traffic injuries and fatalities in African cities. We must follow through with next steps and scale up those already taken. I'm confident that the effort like this, led by UN Habitat, ITDP, UNICEF and others supported by the UN Road Safety Fund will make a difference. Ultimately, I believe the Reclaiming Street project will help ensure that children's voice and rights are the heart of urban mobility, planning and action. That's what we are here for and I thank you of your commitment. There are those moments in life, no matter where you live, no matter how you live, we all know these moments, moments that make a life worth living. The smile of your loved one, the start of a good day, the joy of living your passion and serving the people. One person dies on the road every 24 seconds. Don't let those moments stop too soon. Thank you very much. That was a presentation from Jean Top, Special Envoy of Road Safety, and subsequently a short video on a campaign that is run by the UN Road Safety Fund called Moments to Live For. The essence of the campaign being that life is beautiful and we need to make sure we take the steps necessary in order to protect those and the moments worth living. Speaking of uh, moments worth living and protecting people, the best way we know how to do that is through effective street design and ensuring that roads are safe for people who walk and cycle. And who better to give us some insights on that than street design expert and champion Michael King. He is with us today and will be sharing his insights on street design and ensuring that streets are spaces for people and um, that they are accessible for all. Thank you, Michael, over to you. Thank you. Um, let me figure out how to share my correct screen. Uh, I wanna do this.
Oh, come on. No, Michael, we did actually see your presentation for a moment there in PowerPoint. Right, but I need to now share it in, um, in, in the PowerPoint. In okay. The, in now, now are you seeing it in the- It's like perfect, the thank mode? you. Yeah, that looks well, great, thanks don't, so much. Don't say, it, don't say it's perfect yet until you- uh, Perfect in the sense that I can <laughs> see you and hear you and your presentation's ready what to I go. Have to say. <laughs> uh, I'll also start my video. We're in, um, I'm sitting in a, a Dar es Salaam, looking out over the Indian Ocean um, at a place called Seed Space. Fortunately, I'm here instead of where I'm usually based, which is in New York, because if it was New York, I would have to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. So that's all good. Um, let me just uh, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to present a little bit. Um, thank you for those, uh, the, the introductions. And thanks also for this project because reclaiming streets is a, it's a good thing to do. Um, and, it, you know, yeah, it's a good thing to do. So, so that's what I'm going to sort of just talk about a little bit. And I'll, I love this. I love this image. This is a knock -in. And so this is a, um, an arch from the Romans built this, in, uh, I don't know, 300 AD, something like that. And so we figured out how to, to drive trucks through arches that the Romans did that had survived for 1700 years. And it, it's like, what's going on? We build churches in in texas and then we build highways next to churches um and and we just have to ask ourselves what are we doing what are we what are we doing with our cities what are we doing with our history what are we doing with well how do you sing hymns on sunday morning if if you're sort of have this constant barrage of traffic going you know four meters from your from the window and then more recently, we have Tahir Square in, in Cairo, which is the sort of the scene of, of um, you know, protests and celebrations and marches and, and it's kind of a, a fabled space. And then we, we say, well, let's, let's make the space nicer. And so we're gonna put an obelisk up and, and some stairs and some, some, some things. And then, we'll, and then we'll completely surrounded by a bunch of drivers and will and will not provide will provide one little tiny 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 zebra crossing to get there so you know we should just you should have just left it alone and built a hole who cares you can't get there so what what are we doing um this is miami back to the states and this is 1961 i believe and then they decided, well, we don't really like all the people who live in this neighborhood. So we're going to build this. And um, I don't think they actively said they don't like the people. I just don't think they care because the people are, are sort of not important. So we're just going to destroy their neighborhood because we like highways. And then this is another example from Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford's an interesting city because so 50 years ago or, or 1960, which is almost um, 60 years ago now, is it, it, the population is less, but you can see the red dots, the parking lots are more. So we basically traded people for parking lots. And is that really what you want your cities to do? Is that? So this reclaiming streets is just is about this whole sort of uber notion about what what are we doing with cities? Are we are we having cities with highways through them and parking lots, or are we having cities for people? It's a fair question. And there's good research that this is state by state in, in the United States, like the states that drive more um, have higher fatality rates. So. If you live in a place where, where there's less driving, you're more likely to live. So we, we know this stuff. And here's the latest um, 
it's kind of not a ring road, but it's this sort of the urban highway through Kasumo. Um, and here are all the crashes. Well, where are all the crashes? Well, they're along the highway. Great. We built the highway. Somebody paid for the highway. Some development bank paid for the highway because it was in the name of progress. And so it's just now it's a pretty good place to get in a wreck. We build flyovers in, in Hyderabad. And in the first eight months, you have five or six deaths. That's six deaths in eight months. Do we, you know, are we actively trying to reduce the population? And then we blame the people, the engineers and the authorities. They say, well, we've reflected on the roads and they could be safer. But the people aren't cooperating. They don't have proper discipline. What does that mean? What it means is that the people in charge are washing their hands. They're saying, it's not my fault. You're dying. You're killing yourself. But then we, re then, then, so then we, we apply for funds, clean air and sustainable environment project. Doesn't that sound wonderful? We're going to have clean air and a sustainable environment. And we're going to use that money to pay for a flyover. Because flyovers clean the air. So this is complicated gobbledygook math where people, good people, planners, and they do all these formulas. And they say, if you drive and you never have to stop, you'll pollute less. Because pollution comes from when you stop and start. So if you never have to stop, you'll pollute less. The reality is if you never have to stop, you'll drive more. And if you drive more, you pollute more. Flyovers do not clean the air. Here's some recent article from, from where I am now in, in Dar es Salaam, where the money they've spent on, on three flyovers could have built 150 kilometers of BRT that serves 5 million people. So reclaiming the streets is about understanding what we're spending our money for right now. We can do better. First thing we have to do is understand the difference between street design and highway road engineering. The highway stuff is a center line out. You draw a line between point A and point B, and you move stuff out of the way, and you build a highway. And street design is you have buildings, you have stuff, you have people. And so you, you build in. And this is a fundamental difference that I've put into the, the NACTO street design manuals and other manuals that I've, I've helped written. Um, help write. And it's this fundamental premise. There are many of the same um, math and the, the same sort of concepts, but it's just the way they're applied. Second thing is safe systems approach, aka Vision Zero, which was started by the Swedes in 96, 96, 97. And this is the recognition that humans make errors, we're vulnerable. We don't wear airbags. Responsibility is shared. The next time, so the next time that you have somebody say to you, and the authority say, oh, it's your fault. It's not my fault. Tell them it's all of our fault. It's all of us together. We cannot cast, we cannot shift blame. This acceptance number four is that no death or serious injury acceptable. This is a public health crisis. Why are we building the fact that we're actually allowing ourselves to build systems that kill people is kind of nuts. And proactive. Proactive is a word I started using maybe 25 years ago, where we start, and, and we, coined, we started using this term called proactive street design. And, and it has to do with what you want, not not reacting to what's there. What do we want? We want to be able to walk. We want to be able to ride a bike. We want our kids to be able to go to school. We want caregivers to be able to go to the park. We want 
We want trees. We want clean air. We want, no, we want less noise. I'm here in, in, in Dar es Salaam and my colleague who's based in Nairobi and I say, doesn't the honking bother you? And he said, oh, I'm just used to it. What do we want? Another, another thing to do is that we have to prioritize pedestrians. And this is order um, pedestrians are first and then transit and bicycle, sometimes bicycle is second. And then there's freight and there's other things. But in general, it's, it's it, the prioritize the people that you wanna prioritize. Because at the end of the day, we're all people walking. We all walk, even if we drive, we still walk from the car park to, to, to where we are and we walk to lunch. And, and cities are about exchange. Cities are about trading information and ideas. And the only information and idea you will trade inside of a car is with somebody you're riding with or listening to somebody yak on the car radio. Here's another thing that, that we, we sort of say. The old school of transportation planning and mobility plan is so we're going to build something and then we're going to assume that everyone drives. And then we're going to build parking for everyone that drives and then we're going to build roads. And sort of this is the plumbing approach. If you build a house, you assume that everyone has to go to the toilet. So you put enough toilets in and you build some pipes to go to the toilets and then enough water so you can flush all the toilets. And it makes sense if you're plumbers. We're not plumbers. We're like thinking about how to do a city. And we have programs, we have origins and destinations, we have options with, you know, do we want people to write? What are we planning for? What do we want? That's the thing is that we don't sit around and say what we want. The Koreans figured out what they wanted and what they decided they want is not a highway through the bloody town. And so they reclaimed the creek. The people in Portland, Oregon decided they would rather have cherry blossom trees than a highway. Seems like a good trade. Our friends in South Africa, when they built the BRT system, they said, you know, we would like to have the people who land in Cape Town Airport to take the, the, the BRT into town because it's the most efficient way. This is like the mass transit way. And so they put the station, I mean, you come out, the, you get your luggage and there it is. You have to go behind the station to find the taxis. If you want people to take the VRT from the airport, put it right there. The Tanzanians wanted a VRT system, so they built one. And look, it takes, look at the traffic. We took this picture this morning. It's all good. We got where we were going in 15, 20 minutes. And these people are stuck in traffic for 15, 20 minutes because we're prioritizing transit. This is what it looks like. Our friends in Zambia wanted a big walkway with trees. So they built one. There's no guy that says, well, how wide should the walkway should be and how big should the trees should be? Like, you know what? We want to walk. Let's build a big walkway. That's what we want. My friends in Kisumu, they said, we don't want people to park, put their four wheelers on top of the walkway. So we're gonna put a whole bunch of yellow bollocks and we're gonna build bigger walkways. My friends in Ethiopia built cycle tracks. Because they, they wanna ride bikes. It's part of the NFT master plan. This is some work we did last week in Rwanda where our friends at the uh, streets and highway department, they said, you know, we have these crazy intersections that, that somebody built. Can we, can we calm them? Can we make them safer? Can we make it easier to cross the street? And so we went out and we looked and we had a workshop and we came up with this with sketch. It's just a sketch hot off the presses. And we ended up with a little park in the middle. That's the green stuff in the middle. So instead of having these these big roads or these sort of highway. And this gets back to this whole notion of the difference between highway engineering and street design. Instead of having these gigantic turns that you can go at high speed and kill people in the zebra crossing, you have low speed turns. 
we have short crossing distances. It's all very, 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 I mean, this is, this is an hour's worth of work. And now the, our, our friends in Rwanda are taking this and they're, you know, finessing it and, and they'll do something. It's, we can do it. And here, just yesterday, in Dar, we had a workshop, street design workshop, and we decided to go out with some cones. The only cones we could get on short notice were, were multicolored football cones, which is kind of fun. And we decided to make a um, uh, tactical urbanism, and we made a little island. And you know who the island benefits? The safety island? The little girls and the little boys walking to school. And this guy in the orange shirt. But look, these are the people that we should care about, our kids. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about us. It's the kids. It's the kids that matter. Because they're the future. And what kind of world are we going to live in? What kind of world are we going to leave them? That's it. Thank you so very much, Michael. I particularly loved that um, we're not plumbers. You know, we have choices. There's a whole different mechanism and method that we can use in order to improve streets for people. I also particularly liked the fact that if we design streets for little girls, we also design them for men in orange t-shirts. Because streets for children are streets for people. <laughs> streets for people in orange t-shirts, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Appreciate your inputs. You're welcome. And um, if you have any questions for Michael, please feel free to pop them in the chat. For now, we're going to dive into a presentation from my colleague, Stephanie. She'll be sharing some insights on the road safety project itself. Thanks, Steffi. Over to you. Thank you, Janine. I am unfortunately not overlooking a beautiful ocean but at least uh, some sunshine in Kenya, which is also nice. I am just going to share my screen one quick second. You should be able to see now. Yes, we can. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. Super. Now, full mode. There we go. Okay, super. Good. So. Welcome everybody um, to the kickoff of this project. Uh, we are very excited um, to get started um, on the reclaiming streets for pedestrians and uh, cyclists in African cities. And we uh, have this ambition to build on the global momentum to enhance road safety during and after COVID-19. My name is Stephanie and I work with Janine in the urban mobility team at uh, UN Habitat and we are coordinating this project going forward. Um, I'll be giving you a bit of an insight on the objectives and uh, the structure of the project, and we look forward to the discussion um, thereafter. Good, so in terms of uh, the project objective, we aim to enhance road safety in African cities for people that walk and cycle. And uh, by doing so, we hope that we contribute to the ongoing efforts to reduce road traffic related deaths and injuries in selected countries to below the, the African annual average. Um, we also aim to accelerate uh, the ongoing efforts of governments and financiers in the areas of policy development, local implementation action, um, and also safer street designs uh, to create um, more livable cities and more livable public spaces at the end of the day. Um, this puts our project, I think, into the context. Uh, we have heard before from the special envoy that Africa is the worst performing continent in terms of road safety with a fatality rate of 26.6 per 100,000 inhabitants. And if you look at our partner countries of the project, Guinea, Mozambique, Rwanda, Kenya, and Ethiopia, you can see that their average um, is even um, above uh, the African average. 
And uh, it's also important to note that those numbers are steadily rising. So it's really urgent time to, to work on road safety on this continent. Um, our project has a few innovative approaches that I would like to mention. We are looking at uh, facilitating peer-to-peer -peer exchange between capitals and also secondary and tertiary cities. That is against the background that a lot of work has focused on the capital cities and a lot of lessons are already derived from those. But uh, the need in secondary and tertiary cities that are rapidly urbanizing is as well very high and we hope that we can facilitate a little bit of upscale within the countries from the capitals to the smaller cities. We also aim to place children's voices and rights at the heart of the project. Um, and that will set the project apart from prior NMT initiatives in the region. And thirdly, we, we are looking at applying collaborative uh, street design challenge using a computer game called Minecraft to facilitate uh, community participation. In this is the structure of the project. We have an outcome one that looks at uh, good street designs that are being upscaled in countries that already have an established road safety framework um, that looks at the tier one countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. We then have an outcome two that looks at improving road safety frameworks in countries that have very high fatality rates and the confirmed interest, interest in, uh, in improving the road safety situation. Those are our tier two countries, Mozambique and Guinea. Then we have an outcome three that looks at facilitating an regional exchange across um, our partner countries to share good practices on NMT policy, on infrastructure advocacy, but also to talk about failures and challenges um, of, of the undertaking. And then in an outcome four, we're looking at working with international financial institutions and uh, enhancing investments in safe streets, hopefully achieving a regional impact that goes even beyond the five partner countries. On the next few slides, I'll take you into each of those outcomes. As mentioned, uh, outcome one is focused on the tier one countries, um, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. And we're really looking at uh, countrywide capacity building on scaling up quality street designs and road safety. All those countries already have either a national or local NMT uh, policy or strategy, and they also have um, um, updated or currently being developed um, street design standards that would then be disseminated across the country and we would come in with technical assistance and design re review for implementing safe NMT infrastructure in those countries. In the outcome two, with a focus on Mozambique and Guinea, we are looking at enhancing data on the road safety situation in the country we are looking at supporting the development and review of NMT policies and standards. And we're also looking at um, co-organizing multi-stakeholder collaborations to promote and advocate for safe NMT and low carbon transport. That could, for example, mean the organization of um, car-free days, open street days, and so on. The outcome three is very much linked uh, to the Africa Network for Walking and Cycling that is uh, coordinated by UNEP and WAC21, and a lot of uh, other partners are involved in that as well. So we aim to, to link our regional exchange to the Africa network um, and to yeah, have an even wider outreach of sharing lessons and good practices. The outcome four, as mentioned, would be looking at uh, strengthening the collaboration with financiers of planned infrastructure projects that could, for example, mean that we come in and support NMT audits of um, big infrastructure projects in certain countries, working together with the financiers and also the, the counterpart country representatives, and therefore hopefully achieving a regional impact of the project. And that's it. Um, that's the project. We are very excited to start on it, and we very much appreciate the interest from all the partners that you can see listed. Um, at the bottom, you will also hear from those partners later. And yeah, we very much look forward um, to get this off the ground. Thank you. And back to you, Janine. Thank you so much, Steffi. Appreciate your summary of the project there and being so succinct in the core elements. 
I'm now going to hand over to one of our city officials who's joined us in the session, Francois Zirikana. Thank you so much, Francois, for joining us. As I'm sure many know, um, our city officials are incredibly busy and have a lot on their plate. And so we're, we're always very glad to have them in the room with us. Francois, if you're able to kindly share your screen and you can commence the presentation. Thank you very much. Francois, can you hear us? Are you with us? Fantastic. We can see your screen, but I can't hear you yet, Francois. Huh? Francois? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you so I'm much. Sorry, Francois. I was not able to animate myself. That's why I was not communicating. No problem. No I also <laughs> I also see your, your video is very red. Um are you oh, sorry? Oh, there yeah. you are. Hello. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank yeah, you so you? much for joining us. Good. Thank yeah. you. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you see my screen Appreciate now? It. Yes, we can see your yeah. screen and we can see you as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank my name you. is Afranca Zirikana. Feel I work free to you. Do you hear me? Where? You're very welcome to begin. Thank you, Francois. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So I'm in charge of free mobility and I've been uh, working closely to non operating mode of transport. So in this case, I will be sharing uh, some experience for the stock Tigari in terms of uh, safety as well as the promotion of uh, both walking and, and the cycling. So I, I, I started to show the statistics on the, the model share. If you can see here, the NMT, walking the cycling, takes more than half of mode, more transport modes. So that means something needs to be done to get up for this big percentage of uh, uh, this big percentage of people walking and cycle. So those people need safety. And when it comes to the safety, I tried to make analysis of statistics in a few months last year. It seems that uh, the state of Chigari has the highest portion of uh, highest portion of uh, of uh, accidents, sixty two percent, compared to national total statistics, which means the city is more now vulnerable to road crashes than other part of the country. So, now what are the current initiatives when it comes to working in the sector? So we are trying to provide the adequate walkways, creating more car-free zones, car-free days, cycling lanes, bicycle share system. We are now developing the non-motor transport master plan, and as well as trying to deploy the road safety management systems. So if you can see here, uh, this, this is the time of infrastructure we are providing for people who are, are working, this is the CBD, so this is the car-free zones. We are now have three locations of car-free zones. Uh, you can see this is the CBD, this is the, here we call it the cement, see this is the, the other part of the CBD. So yeah, and the people are really welcoming the, the car-free zones. And we, we think to add even more. So there's car free zones. So car free days, that means we do it twice a month, where most of the roads 
they are cruising for cars and use it by 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 only people in, in, in the cyclists. So this infrastructure, you can see the the, the, the second grains as well as use their partner the good right to provide a bike share system. In the partnership with uh, the ITDP, we are working on development of the transport master plan, which we think will also give us an overview and the point of uh, for implementation of uh, non-motorized non infrastructure. So we are also trying to improve the safety for all road users, including the cyclists as well as the pedestrians, by providing the infrastructure as well as using the 3D cameras to try to, uh, to, to control the speed limits. We are doing the campaigns as well as the vehicle inspections. That's where we are, but some more are to come. We are want to extend the cycling, the cycling facilities. What we have now, if you come back here, it seems the same to the expense infrastructure, but we want to make it more cheaper using, for example, the dividers, but which are very simple so that we can increase more distance for, people, for the cycling. So not only that, but we are going to also introduce the seed for kids. It's, which is more or less similar to car prisons, but in other families, safety for the, the kids. So that's it actually for this of Tigari. If there is any quick question, I'll be able to answer it. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Franz. I appreciate your inputs. And also really love the emphasis on making sure that your interventions are affordable. And, and they are affordable interventions that can be multiplied in multiple places. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to our next speaker who is presenting from Mozambique. Francois, if possible, could you, uh, there you go, perfect. <laughs> uh, could you perhaps stop sharing your screen for a moment? Thank you. Thank you, Francois. If you have any questions for Francois, kindly type them in the chat. But in the meantime, I would like to welcome the mayor of Kilimane, Mayor Di Arruyo. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I had a wonderful conversation with our colleagues in the Mozambique office about Kiliman and her words were in Kiliman, a bicycle is part of the family. And I think that's really something special. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you have the possibility to speak? Have you been unmuted? Yes, yes, I can speak now. Perfect, thank you very much. Here. Here I am for a moment. I'm going to share screen for you. So feel free to say um, next when it's the right moment, or if you'll be speaking in Portuguese, kindly just let me know um, what no, the next no, I will, change I will, channel to English. I will be speaking You're, in English. That's fantastic. Okay, I will be sharing your, your presentation for you then in one moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, really a great pleasure to me to be part uh, of this dialogue. So, of course, I'm very pleased to see that Mozambique is part of this project. I know that this us in Mozambique is uh, like the first in a, what we expect to be a very long journey. Mane is the capital city of Asia province, about 400,000 habitants and uh, we have uh, about 5,000 cyclists in our city and uh, one of our or our entry points had to do with the level of accident that we are experiencing in, in Kaliman. So when I became a mayor for the first time when I was elected in 2011 one of my priorities was to make sure that uh, we brought cycling and uh, the decarbonized kind of transport into the mainstream of the politics. And actually I made a standpoint in making sure that uh, during my campaign to become elected that I will only use bicycle and not car. Of course, at that time it was really a challenge. And my first challenge was 
to convince my own team that uh, it was possible because they didn't be believe in it. Uh, so convincing them was really hard and a challenge. And biking in my city was seen and uh, actually for a considerable part of this in my, city, in, in my country, by, uh, biking is seen as a poorest mean of transport. We're trying to change that view. And, and today I am considered a, the biking man because I go to office biking and most of the, of the, of the time I commute biking. But I, know I had a very interesting incident that during the Glasgow conference, um, U, UN conference on climate change, I received uh, a visit in my city of about 10 um, um, ambassadors from Canada and Finland and other countries. When they came to visit me, I invited them to, I wanted to show them my city so that uh, uh, we could link my city with the ambassador and with the conference going on uh, in Glasgow. I mean, to my surprise, the national police, the national guard came and uh, stopped us from bike. I mean, you can imagine the scandal that it was, stopping the mayor in, in his own city, stopping more than 10 ambassadors from biking. And when I asked them, why were they stopping me? They said it was because of COVID. Of course, it was a nonsense. And I had to talk to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of my country to allow us to bike. So I'm bringing this example to show you that in some corners of the world, biking is not as free as it should be. So we face political, but of course, we also face uh, issues about capacity, but also challenges, uh, I mean, financial challenges. And um, what are we trying to do in my country, in, in my city? My city has got more bicycles per capita than any other city. And my dream is really to make Kelimane City as the biking capital, not only of Mozambique, which it already is, but also the biking capital of Africa. I recently went to Grenoble, which is Grenoble, which is the European or uh, Green City capital. They are doing and to ex exchange our views. So we currently, we are building the first cycle line, not only in my city, but the first cycle in the whole Mozambique. Actually, even Maputo, which is the capital, doesn't have a single meter of uh, paved or dedicated road, I mean, uh, lane for those who bike. Actually, a recent build, I mean, I mean a, a, a recent bridge, which was built some five years ago, very modern, has got a sign saying no cycling. Like, how can you build a bridge in the 21st century where you deny people from cycling? So there is still a taboo about cycling. And our journey is to change that because we think that non-motorized uh, means of transport are not only good for the, for, for the people's health, but also for the health of the environment. So the first uh, cycle line that, that we are building, that we are building actually with the support from TDA and from the environmental fund from Portugal is about three kil kilometers. And last week I was in Lisbon and I had a meeting with the Portuguese Minister of Environment and he agreed to support us on another three kilometers of cycleway. So th those two are going to be the first cycle ways in my country. I hope to continue and to scale up, but of course we need people who understand the challenge, who knows how to build those cycle lanes, but also we need the financial resources to do that. My second point in the agenda is actually to transform the front side of my city, because we there is a, a river that goes through, and we, we, we have got a very important road there called Avenida Marginal. And so our challenge is to transform that into a non-motorized way. And the issue there is that we will have to start slowly. So our first phase will be on Saturdays and Sundays to transform this road and promote child-friendly activities and trade fairs 
and uh, other tourist attractions in that road by putting away uh, cars or other kind of motorized transport. And also this, we are going to celebrate the World Bicycle Day. And uh, actually three weeks ago, if I'm not mis mistaken, I was informed that I won the 2022 award for gold award for cycling. So cycling is our flag, is the way that uh, we think that we can include people and, 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 and also combat discrimination against the poor, not only the poorest, but also those who decide consciously to not pollute by using non-motorized means of transport. I, can you go to, to, to the second page? Yes, there we, we have data on the status of road safety in Mozambique and also grouped in terms of accidents involving no motorized transport in Mozambique in 2002. As you can see there. Uh, next, please. Thank you very, very, very much. So slide, I tried to summarize the main challenges that uh, cycling or using the means of transport in my city, but also in, in, in Mozambique. The challenges, and what are the challenges, the issues that we face addre addressing the needs of people that walk and cycle. First of all, we don't have, uh, I say, we don't have enough data on not only on accidents in other cities, but also in terms of number of people using a kind of transport. And I mean, I listed there one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are like the main. Road safety and the active, please. Next page. That, uh, it's very important that uh, we align and cooperate uh, in terms of education. It's very important that we educate our citizens about the advantages and about the importance. But it is not enough. We need to lead by example. So because the mayor of Kilimani uses bicycles, not only in Kilimani, but wherever I go, I was in, 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 in Paris, a month ago, and I was biking there. I was in Lisbon. I do bike when I go there. But like, you know, it shows to people that biking is not only for poor people, but it's a, a means, a, a, a healthy means of trust. So we need to move on from the world where biking is seen as the poor transport. I receive in my city ambassadors or other dignitaries I normally invite them for a ride, and they've been very forthcoming. I rode in my seat with the American ambassador, and as, as I mentioned, with the Swedish ambassador, with the Finnish, Canadian, and other officials who visit my city. And actually, I do have been a, on a kind of a campaign to convince the Secretary of, of State for Youth and the other sector of, 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 of state for sports to embark on this journey so that we can motivate more and more people. And it's very important for us to note that um, if we don't have data, it's very difficult to come up with the right policy. And we need to take the non-motorized challenges and policies at the heart of our policy making. And one of the ways to bear or more one of the most effective ways is, as I mentioned a bit before, leading by example. It's also very important that, of course, Kelimani has got an advantage because we have got a very plain uh, city. So it's very easy to conduct by. And please, next, that's the page. Here I have got a kind of uh, yes a, a, a circle in terms of non-motorized in 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 in, in, in 
today, people feel proud of biking because they do bike. I mean, we also need to be ambitious. We need to set up uh, high standards. And one of my challenges, as I mentioned before, I want not only to be the biking capital of my country, but the biking capital of Africa. We need support from those who have the knowledge, but also for those who have got the resources and the experience in coming up with this kind of because most of the time we have got the will, we have got the ambition, we have, we have got the pride, but we don't have the technical staff that could help us in implementing. As I mentioned, I had cycle lines in my first manifesto in 2011, but only 2021, that's when I managed to get the human capacity and the financial resources to deliver on that promise and to deliver on that um, uh, objective. Please, next. From had, uh, a gentleman who was working at my municipality and he was doing his PhD in Spain. I encouraged him in, in transport management to study the case of, of, of Kaliman. So today we have a considerable amount of data because he went to the field and he collected the data. So we've been using and promoting the data that Asio Mendiate collected while doing his PhD. And what, what we noticed is, is that very few children do bike in Kelpane, but also in Muzi. Very few women do bike. And when we try to understand why, the number one reason was that because they didn't feel so safety is of, of a paramount importance if we want to, to promote biking and no motorized transport. Kelimane, I want to add, it was considered as a children-friendly city because of the policies that we've been implementing to make or to transform the city into a children's friendly city. So by Think, and we are convinced that by building these cycle lines, we are also creating a possibility for children, for more children to bike. And I, of course, as I say, I did with myself by biking. I also bought uh, two bicycles to my two children. So they also do bike. When I go around on weekends biking, they come with, with, with me and other people see that, oh, it's not only the mayor biking, you know, the mayor's wife also bikes. The mayor's sons and daughters do also bike. So that's a way of also of promoting and making sure that we are really committed to and promote safety, but not non-motorized means of transport. Thank you very much. Dr. Deruel, thank you so very much for your presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed hearing you speak because I can hear the passion in your voice. Um, is it true that you, you also wrote your PhD on non motorized transport? Uh, no, no, I did my, my PhD on economics. Or, Economy, but, uh, oh, okay. It, it Classio, feels as if you Classio. it feels as if you might have a PhD in NMT, <laughs> so that's really okay. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Classio Mendiati is the person who got his um, PhD on cycling in Kiliman. and actually okay. it has been, it, uh, he has been publishing several articles about four or five on on, on the case of Kiliman. We, oh, we I can okay. share I can share articles so that you know we. That would be fantastic. That would be fantastic. And also on behalf of you and Habitat team, hearing that you have some plans for some new bicycle lanes and some initiatives, we're very happy to support in design review or in any other elements you, where you feel where you feel we could contribute. Thank you so much Thank for, you your time for joining the session. Thank you. If we have any questions for, for the mayor, you can write them in the chat and we can see if there is a moment to address them. For now, we're waiting for one of our speakers to join us. So I'm going to play another short video from the United Nations Road Safety Fund for you while we wait for the short intermission. One moment, thank you.
Il a collé à Arnia et un cas de président. Alina Ahmed se contourne. Ok, pour un chat, je vais One person dies on the road every 24 seconds. Don't let those moments stop too soon. Thank you for your patience, everyone. We're waiting for one of our speakers to connect with us. But in the meantime, we're very lucky to have Mr. Vipul Patel with us from the city of Mombasa and the county government. Vipul, thank you for joining us. It was just a few weeks ago that we were cycling in Mombasa. We'd be happy to hear some of your inputs and, and some of your feedback on the session so far. Yeah, thanks, it's a pleasure. I'm sorry, I was a bit late. I had a couple of meetings. No yeah, worries, we had no a good worries. time in Mombasa and we are very focused on the cycling lanes and a lot of other stuff that's coming up. Uh, Chris is aware of what we're doing in Mombasa. I guess this is not the forum, but I was told by uh, Caroline that there'll be a separate forum for Kenya. So we'll put our views and our plans for the next uh, five years on cycling. Hi, everybody. Yes, we pull you're exactly right. As part of this project, we'll be hosting workshops in the individual countries where we'll sit down with the authorities and really just have a moment to plan the next steps. Um, so you're very right. Thank you for, for noting that. And please do get your plans in the working so we can, we can share with the wider community. I, I do see here that Kajela has joined us from Ethiopia. Thank you so much, Vipul, for, for sharing a bit of an input there. But for now, we will ask Kijela to share. Thank you so much for joining us in this session, Kijela. I, I want to note that when I was chatting with the UN Habitat team in Ethiopia, as well as our ITDP colleagues, and we were trying to determine who would be the best person, unanimously, it was you. So I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. If you'll give me a moment, I'll share my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you are hearing me. Yes, Kijel, I can hear you perfectly. One moment and I will share my screen for you. Okay. All right, over to you when you're ready. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, all of you uh, participants. Uh, you know, I am Kajela from Addis Ababa. Uh, city administration transport uh, bureau in ethiopia so uh, i want to uh, thank all of you for giving this chance to discuss the main challenges uh, regarding to road safety as well as the enmities so uh, i want to have share some uh, information uh, what we have discussed what we have done in our cities so uh, that are very short and a brief that we have done for the past five, six years. Next screen, sorry. So uh, here in our city, the status of the road safety is the main issue in a, a city for residents. 
because the uh, number of pedestrians, uh, cyclists, uh, as well as the uh, other enmity uh, are very high, but the number of uh, traffic accidents is very high in our city. So in 2015, we have uh, very high accidents uh, happening in our city. Around uh, 448 people were, were uh, fatalities. So these are mainly the very serious uh, problem that are 1,912. So here the main uh, uh, accident was happened on the pedestrians as well as the uh, cyclists uh, from the all accidents happening here. Around 88% of the road crash were happening on this pedestrian uh, or enmities. So Addis Ababa needs the strategies to solve these very uh, accidents or very important uh, views to, to reduce the traffic accidents in our cities. So what we have done is to prepare the uh, strategies that is mainly focused on the road safety strategy, which is focused on only for 10 years. Next. So uh, as we have said that the activities to reduce these traffic accidents mainly attack the uh, enmities or the pedestrians as well as the cyclists. We have prepared the strategies for 10 years. So these are from 2017 up to 2030. So this is the main activity we have done because we have two directional to solve this pro problem. So after that, Different activities will be done, reviewing the uh, traffic rules and the regulations, uh, awareness creation for the road users, uh, campaigns relating to the speeding, drink and drive, uh, the seat belt as well as the uh, uh, helmet. So these are the main activities we have tried to uh, do, we have done in our cities. And in other ways, we have to, improve the infrastructure. Road uh, traffic accident can happen maybe because of this, uh, the lack of the uh, uh, comfortable infrastructure for the road user. So what we have done is to improve the existing road uh, infrastructure in our cities. As you have seen in this screen, we have prepared different programs. One of them is the safe intersection program. These are the accidents on the pedestrian uh, cyclist will be happening at the intersection. So we have to uh, redesign and improve the intersection by the uh, safe intersection program. So at this moment, we have uh, uh, mainly focused on the road users, what are, uh, we have said, enmities. In other ways, uh, we have uh, worked on the mainly focusing on the speeds. So we have reduced the uh, city is maximum speed is in our cities and prepare the uh, speed zones. Maybe in the resident areas, we have prepared to make the speeds uh, or low speeds. In other ways, the capacity building on the enforcement uh, uh, implementer that are traffic police and other uh, uh, we are doing on the enforcement. These are the main activities to focus on the reduction of the traffic accidents in our cities. Next. So uh, one example we have, uh, have the result from what we have done in 2020 and 2011. 2011. So, uh, so we have the uh, reduction of the accidents in uh, our city, around 70% of deaths and 40% uh, serious injury. Because of this, we have saved around 39 people from, uh, 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 from death. So this is a very, very important and we have satisfied what we have done because we have saved these more people from accident in this. It is, it is interesting and it is have uh, more, 
what we have to do in the next, this shows the activities what we have to do in the next. Next, sorry. In other way, we have uh, different challenges we have faced in these uh, enmities uh, in our cities. For example, in cycling, uh, are they mainly focused on the what we are facing challenge and the pedestrian also in some cases. These are the poor as well as unsafe enmities for the uh, uh, in case of infrastructure because pedestrians have no enough infrastructure to walk around the road. Cyclists have no infrastructure to cycling. Uh, only the uh, road construct was only focusing on the uh, traffic only or the motorized vehicles. That was the first one. Uh, cycling culture in our city is uh, very, uh, very poor as well as people are not walking very short distances, only they will use uh, another mode of transport. Congestion, this, may, this is mainly happening on the uh, peak hour, mainly morning and the evening when the, uh, uh, the people come from home and to uh, their office and they were from office to their homes. So uh, the traffic also very congested at this time. Uh, low awareness, we, we have low awareness about the using the cycling or the walking as well as enforcement. Our enforcement is very poor in our city. So uh, traffic uh, or driver can park on the cycle lane or in the uh, uh, pedestrian walkway. A limitation of the technical skill on this mainly, which is focused on the enmities and the uh, no enough data, which is regarding to land use and the uh, uh, transport, as well as the main challenges, the budget constraints uh, that we face on the enmities in our cities. Sorry, next. So we have uh, then uh, different uh, workers to, to, to have uh, uh, improve the work is related to the enmities or the reduce the uh, traffic accident and the mobilities. These are we have prepared different. Uh, different uh, uh, road safety uh, strategies, implementation strategy, enmity strategy, uh, also as well as cycling, uh, cycling, safe cycling guideline as well as road safety audit guideline. We have uh, prepared to have good uh, road safeties and uh, mobilities. And uh, what we have done on this, there are different organizations prepare, uh, helping us from the higher level to uh, cities. For example, the federal government has helped us mainly on this work. Mayor office, as well as traffic management agency, which is working on the traffic as well as police commission, city plan commission, and the other non-governmental organization. Maybe this can be locally or internationally. Such are some of the uh, local are safe. Uh, the nations are the main volunteers which are uh, working on the uh, physical uh, exercising, as well as the communities also working on the uh, this uh, uh, safety and the uh, audits. So, we have the very interesting uh, uh, event is what we have in our city is the Mangad uh, Leso that we means the car free day. So this is the mainly uh, what we have uh, all the uh, last day of uh, Sunday in uh, the month. So we have this uh, very interesting uh, event is people are coming to the uh, uh, roads. Uh, the roads will be closed for the traffic and uh, they can play football or doing a, a physical exercise or the cycling. This all then be by the, uh, that day. So now we are pre trying to have this every Sunday in our cities because the people are very interested on this uh, uh, event. Next, sorry. So, uh, there are uh, innovations that we have uh, in our uh, cities that I've said this Mangal Leso. 
This means at this Mangat Lesser or the car free day death, the children will be trained the cycling. This is used, uh, used as for having a cycling culture in our cities and they will play football or the handball, other uh, ball. So uh, they can have uh, running, skating, or the, uh, making the, the, the physical exercise in our city. So these are be done by, as I've said, the, some volunteers which have uh, training this, uh, giving this training for children. For example, cycling will be trained by the unexperienced person for the children, as well as the, uh, the physical exercise will be done by the uh, volunteers which have their own uh, uh, physical uh, schools and uh, different organizations will be participating to, to, to have a good event in these uh, uh, days. Next. So uh, as I'm said, for uh, ensuring safe mobility for uh, the children, in our city, we have done different uh, workers. For example, what I have said, uh, safe school zone. So safe school zone means saving the children from traffic accidents. This can be maybe the uh, uh, preparing or different uh, uh, work related to speed or the infrastructure improvement or the awareness raising for the children will be done at the school or uh, school zone speed limit also the main work we have done. This is the maximum speed we have in around the school zone is a uh, 13, so less than 13 kilometers per hour, we have posted around the every schools, which are mainly open to the roads. Cycling training, so these are, we have done at the elementary school, cycling training, uh, uh, or making the students will be have a cycling culture uh, to have, uh, then this we have made, given for TOT for the, uh, physical education uh, uh, teachers to, to include the cycling in their work is when they have uh, physical uh, training, as well as awareness creation on the road safety. Every uh, in medias or other different uh, mass medias we have used to have children to save their service from the traffic accident, as well as we have done in car free days, we have uh, trainers, which is training, giving the training for the children. Uh, as you have seen in the picture, they will uh, have full uh, 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 materials to train the cycling on the ground. So this will be done on the car free days uh, every uh, Sunday that is done in the car free day or Mangad Leso in our cities. Next. So this is a very short uh, uh, brief uh, about the safe, safety and the uh, other uh, enmity uh, work that you have done in our cities. Uh, thank you very much for all. Thank you so much, Kajela McConnell. I really appreciate your presentation and for making the time to give us, I mean, a brief but very insightful glimpse of road safety in Ethiopia. We're very much looking forward to working with you going forward. I'll now hand over to my colleague in Guinea. Um, we have Tarawa Mohamed Lamin with us. He is a GIS expert that is embedded in the UN Habitat system in Guinea. Um, Mohamed, over to you when you're ready. Thank you. For those that are not in the English channel specifically, I believe that Tawa Muhammad will be presenting in French, so you can select the English channel at this moment. Okay, uh, bonjour à tout le monde. 
Donc, je me nomme Tare Mohamed Lamine, je suis l'expert en géomatique au fond de premier habitat. Donc, à l'image de mes prédécesseurs, je vais partager la situation de la Guinée. Avant de commencer, je voudrais signifier que nous sommes ici avec nos différents partenaires du, au niveau du gouvernement, notamment le ministère de la Ville et le gouvernement. Donc, je suis avec nous la présentation dans la salle de projection. Donc, rapidement, pour commencer, je vais donner une situation de la sécurité aussi en Guinée qui n'est pas différente de celle des autres pays africains. Donc, comme cela a été dit, la moyenne africaine se situe autour de 26%, plus de 26%. Mais en Guinée, nous avons jusqu'à 28,2%, ce qui est très élevé selon l'OMS. Pour ce qui concerne le nombre de personnes euh, tuées lors de la il a autour de 3174 sur le plan national et dans la ville de Konak, de 1230 de la moyenne nationale. Oh, Mohamed, sorry for interrupting. Oui? We cannot see your presentation. We're currently in a file with you. If you could just open the, the document there. Je l'avais partagé un instant. Would you like me to share the screen? Est-ce qu'il est visible maintenant? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Je l'ai partagé encore bien. Vous ne voyez pas? Bon, vous pouvez partager si ce n'est pas encore visible. Yes, we can see it now. Thank you. OK, donc. OK, d'accord, merci. Donc, pour ce qui concerne le nombre de personnes tuées dans la loi de l'accident, selon l'Institut national de la statistique, euh, en 2009, il y a eu jusqu'à 50 mineurs qui sont morts dans les actions qui est très, très élevé. Donc, cette situation est la résultante de plusieurs facteurs. Que nous inscrivons en termes de challenge. D'abord, on n'a presque pas de. de, de, de pendant le, le, transport, euh, le transport non motorisé n'est presque pas une réalité en, en Guinée et aussi pour le reste du pays parce que d'abord, il n'y a pas de voie pour cela et les trottoirs n'existent presque pas. Et les trottoirs qui sont là, sont soit encombrés par les marchands ou soit sont utilisés pour les parkings. Donc, ce qui, reste, ce qui rend la circulation, la mobilité des personnes, des piétons très difficile. Pour cela, le gouvernement a initié certaines actions, notamment la construction des passerelles sur les voies principales pour faciliter la traversée des, des voies par les piétons. Mais sauf que ces passerelles n'ont pas été construites, en, en fait, la population bénéficiaire n'a pas été consultée pour la construction de ces passerelles-là. Donc, vous verrez que ça, il y a les passerelles, mais les gens essaient encore toujours de traverser euh, ces, euh, la voie sous ces passerelles et des voies qui sont, en fait, utilisées par des, par des voitures, soit des motos qui roulent à grande vitesse. Donc, plus souvent, les gens, les piétons sont tués sous ces ponts-là même, ce qui est vraiment déplorable. Également, un autre facteur, c'est que ces passerelles, en fait, ne prennent pas en fait, euh, les personnes en mobilité réduite. Très peu de ponts à piétons sont, en fait, off cette facilité-là. Mais il y a également des, des avancées en termes de politique, parce que les nouvelles politiques de planification actuelles ont intégré euh, cet aspect de transport non motorisé. On a d'abord euh, le schéma directeur de, de Kaloum et des îles de l'Ost. Pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas la Guinée, Kaloum, c'est le centre euh, administratif. Donc, il y a un schéma directeur qui a été élaboré pour cela. Donc, vous allez le voir dans le slide suivant. Il y a tout un schéma de, de, de voies 
qui a été euh, désigné pour cela. Également, il y a l'autre euh, document de planification qui est le schéma de repère du camp qu'on a créé, dont Pony Habitat à la charge d'élaborer. Donc, dans ce, dans ce schéma, la, le transport non motorisé est pris en compte, notamment dans, dans le plan d'aménagement détaillé que nous faisons dans une des communes, dans un quartier, dans l'une des communes très urbanisées. Et l'avantage est que ce, ce plan d'aménagement pourra être après dupliqué sur d'autres quartiers qui ont les mêmes caractéristiques. Et l'autre idée également à apprécier, c'est que Maintenant, on a un plan de déplacement urbain pour la ville de pour le Grand Conakry. Le Grand Conakry, c'est les cinq communes initialement de Conakry, plus d'autres euh, communes périphériques qui sont, qui sont ajoutées. Donc, dans ce plan de développement urbain, l'aspect de transport non motorisé est très, très pris en compte, ce qui est à saluer. Donc, également, vous le verrez, une, une maquette dans le slide suivant. Où c'est des voies qui sont des voies proposées qui sont l'autre c'est bien compte d'innovation urbaine de la sécurité routière qui met l'accent particulier de la sécurité urbaine qui met l'accent sur euh, la sécurité routière. Donc, cet observatoire a été mis en place au niveau du ministère de la Sécurité par l'ONU Habitat en collaboration avec euh, le PNUD sous financement du PBF. Donc, un peu plus devant, on va donner un peu plus de détails sur cet observatoire et ce que nous faisons au sein de cet observatoire. Donc, comme je vous le disais précédemment, voilà, à gauche, à sur le schéma à gauche, c'est le, euh, le plan de développement urbain qui a été proposé. Et là, c'est la commune, le centre administratif. Donc, le schéma en vert, ça, c'est la piste euh, des poulets piétons et de, qui a été proposée dans ce plan de déplacement. Et l'image à droite, vous avez une maquette d'un exemple de transport pour les piétons. Et ça, c'est pour un quartier de cette même commune administrative. Également, nous notons en termes d'innovation, d'abord, euh, une volonté des autorités de pouvoir inverser la tendance qu'il faut saluer. Donc, cela, cette volonté a permis de mettre en place la GISEN, qui est l'Agence guinéenne pour la sécurité routière, à l'image des autres pays africains. Euh, des autres pays africains sous proposition des Nations Unies. Donc, c'est une agence qui va servir d'interface pour, pour les échanges sur le plan régional et aussi international. Et la a eu aussi également de collecter des informations sur la sécurité routière effect, également. Et il y a l'Observatoire guinéen de la sécurité urbaine dont nous avons mentionné précédemment. Donc, Nous l'avons mis en place et l'innovation dans la sécurité routière sont collectées de façon instantanée avec des applications, avec des tablettes. Donc, de sorte qu'à tout instant, on peut connaître la situation de la sécurité urbaine dans un, dans un lieu donné. Et euh, la force de, ce, de cet observatoire, c'est que nous avons pu réunir toutes les parties prenantes qui interviennent dans ce sens-là, c'est-à-dire la police, la, la police, les hôpitaux, le ministère du transport, donc ils ont tous été invités. Donc, non seulement nous collectons les données sur la faits sécurité, mais aussi, on fait aussi également le suivi des personnes qui sont accidentées après qu'ils aient été transférés à l'hôpital, et ce qui est très, très intéressant. Donc, sur les images à droite, la première image en haut, ça, c'était lors de la formation des points de cours de l'observatoire. Et l'image en bas, vous avez une carte qui est produite à partir de, des informations collectées sur le terrain. Donc, ça veut dire que les informations collectées ont des références géographiques qui permettent déjà de pouvoir cartographier tous les frais sécuritaires. 
et permettre aussi aux, aux décideurs, aux parties prenantes de pouvoir prendre des actions visant à améliorer euh, la situation. Et l'autre aspect intéressant, c'est qu'il y a un engagement très fort de la société civile, ce qui est à saluer, euh, à l'image de, ce, de, de cette ONG qui est nommée Obermu, okay, qui est une ONG qui évolue dans ce sens-là. Il travaille beaucoup avec les taxis moto qui sont beaucoup très fréquents dans la ville de Conakry et qui sont aussi à l'origine de beaucoup d'accidents, que ce soit avec euh, les piétons ou avec d'autres véhicules. Donc, ils sont beaucoup plus euh, comment dire ça, impliqués dans les accidents. Donc, cette ONG, non seulement en plus de pouvoir aussi collecter les informations sur les faits sécuritaires liés à la route, et aussi travaille avec. Euh, euh, les taxis moto pour pouvoir améliorer la sécurité ou donner certains conseils pour inverser la tendance. Donc là, on peut noter ça en termes d'innovation et des choses, des points sur lesquels il faudra travailler non, au niveau de, sur le plan national pour pouvoir améliorer la sécurité routière. Pour ce qui concerne la mobilité des enfants, la situation n'est pas très réalisante parce que à Conakry, vous avez la plupart des écoles qui sont situées au bord des voies principales. Donc, on l'a mentionné un peu précédemment, il n'y a, a pas de signalisation sur les routes, c'est-à-dire de limitation des vitesses, etc. Et là, vous avez... Euh, les écoles qui sont situées au bord de la route où les enfants doivent euh, traverser la route pour aller, ce qui devient très, très dangereux. Donc, ces écoles-là ont initié, ont articulé, qu'ils utilisent euh, des, le tricolore national. Vous pouvez le voir ici, l'image à droite en haut, pour pouvoir faire passer les enfants aux heures de pointe, c'est-à-dire entre 8 jusqu'à 8 h 30. Donc, ça permet d'atténuer un peu la situation. Mais, sauf qu'après, il n'y a pas cette action-là. Et les enfants se retrouvent face aux motos, aux voitures qui roulent à grande vitesse. Et ce qui justifie le nombre de cas d'accident que nous avons mentionné un peu plus haut. Également, cette situation est de même pour les écoles parce que qui ont, à leur propre initiative, essayé de mettre des bandes blanches devant leur école pour faciliter euh, la traversée des enfants. Sauf que ça n'arrange pas grandement la situation parce que, premièrement, on constate que les gens ne sont pas vraiment éduqués à ces, à ces signes de, 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 de signalisation. Parce que vous pouvez être sur des bandes blanches et des gens roulent à grande vitesse sur vous. Ça veut dire qu'il n'y a pas une connaissance, une appropriation de ces, de ces signaux-là par les conducteurs. Donc, ces écoles également sont obligées d'utiliser ou de faire la même chose comme les autres, c'est-à-dire mettre une personne avec les drapeaux pour pouvoir aider les gens à traverser. Donc, c'est peut-être le lieu, nous, ici, à l'intérieur, vu que nous avons déjà le gouvernement, le, le cas du gouvernement avec nous, de pousser la réflexion, comment est-ce que nous pouvons travailler à inverser cette situation-là. Donc, c'était un peu ce que nous avions à partager au niveau, nous, au niveau de la Guinée. Donc, nous travaillons avec un peu tous nos partenaires et on le fera également dans ce... Dans, ce, dans le cadre de ce projet. Et les présentations initiales nous ont donné vraiment beaucoup plus d'idées sur comment est-ce que nous pouvons améliorer la sécurité ou améliorer le transport non motorisé, plus spécifiquement la mobilité des, des piétons et des, des enfants. Je vous remercie. Thank you so very much for joining us today and for your presentation. That was really fantastic. Um, and thank you to our translators as well. I just want to say, I, I really felt that it was exactly at the same moment and I'm grateful for their participation in this session too. All right, I'm now going to hand over to one of my colleagues, 
who will be sharing a video for us on the status of mobility in Mombasa more generally. Over to the tech team then. And thank you again, Mohamed Rara. Appreciate your time. Merci. A few years back, the county government uh, decided to invest in uh, walking and footpaths to make the city more walkable. Over the years, the, we turned our city into a car-friendly uh, city as opposed to a, a people-friendly uh, city. Cities have always existed, and they've existed for, for, for people to walk. Um, but then, only a hundred years is when we changed uh, our cities from people friendly and walking friendly cities to car friendly cities. So we left the human beings and focused on the machines. And, uh, and, and in that process, it has, we didn't realize it has taken us 100 years to realize that this is not it, this is not right. We, we've taken away the life out of our cities. And uh, so that, that made us uh, think, uh, think about it. And of course, we saw what other countries and other cities were doing. And uh, we saw sense in that. When I was a child growing up, and I know many of us still, still have, 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 the same, have the same thing in our minds, is that I used to sit in the car with my parents, and I used to ask, why can't the government make more lanes, bigger roads? Why? You know, whenever we start in traffic, but then you grow up later and then you find yourself in now um, being in charge and responsible for traffic management and infrastructure. And then you come to realize that that is not the case. And the more lanes you build, we, we actually we make create a we create a demand for cars to use them. barabara imetusaidia sana. Juu ingekuwa hivi aziko ingekuwa hapako hivi. Kama mvua ingekuwa imenyesha kungekuwa labda na matoto hivi. Sasa hivi ni wamejenga hizi at least tunatusaidia magari na kutakando na pia watu wanapotaka nani inapunguza ajali na maafa pia. Thank you so much to the team for playing that video, giving us a bit of insight into the ongoing activities in Mombasa, which thanks to this project is going to be one of the many cities involved in the peer learning processes and in the improving of facilities for people that walk and cycle. I'd now like to check in with some of our partners who are actively involved in this project. To start, I'd like to see if Joanne is with us. Joanne, if, if you are, I'd like to welcome you to share some of your thoughts on the session so far. Joanne is calling in from the headquarters in uh, New York from UNICEF. Thank you so much for being here today with us today, Joanne. How, how do you feel about the session so far? Do you have some thoughts to share with us? Thank you so much for including us, UNICEF, in this presentation today. I'm just thrilled to be here. And actually, even though it was 5 a.m. for me, so Michael, I do hear you about getting up early, but actually it has not been a problem because all of you have been so inspiring that what I've heard has been excellent. And I just want to say that UNICEF is engaged in, in road safety because for children and adolescents between the age of five and 19, it is our number one cause of death. Uh, for these young people. So it is highly important that we, uh, that we partake in this activity. And so we see that it's important. And when we look globally, Africa continent is the number one uh, leading area with the highest number of deaths and serious injuries as well. So we see this region is highly important to us. The excellent messages and presentations, uh, as I said, have been a really excellent examples and, and demonstrating that we know what works 
you are demonstrating uh, what has to happen. And not only are you being leaders, but as the mayor has, as our bicycling mayor has shown us to also be a champion, which is really important if we want to make things work. And some of the data that's been shown by the presenters also has been highly important to demonstrate that it's not only about increasing our mobility uh, through cycling and walking, but when we do that, we're also increasing the probability of risk of exposure to more serious injuries and deaths. So it is highly important that when we're increasing that ability for this mobility, that we're really implementing what we know works. We have to put these good practices in place. And it's through the safe distance approach, as was explained in our earlier presentations, but we need to combine these aspects of education, engineering, and enforcement, just as said by our last colleague saying, putting crosswalks down, you know, it, it, it's demonstrating and highlighting that, but unless we actually put some other measures in place that physically force drivers to slow their speed down, including speed bumps, narrowing the roads, enforcing the limitations of speed, that, that the speed is not going to be low enough for children to be able to cross those roads safely. So we need to be combining those good practices to make sure that really effective. And has been also highlighted is we've indicated how important data is that we have to be able to show what is the situation before we put our interventions in and what improvements we've made. And the excellent examples have demonstrated that we have this. So all the things that we've seen in the presentations today are examples of what we should be doing, but we need to be able to scale those up scale those up and get commitments from governments to engage and do the good work that we've been demonstrating in some of these wonderful examples already today. How do we make that happen at a larger scale? Because when we're doing that, we have to, as said by the mayor, we need to lead by example. UNICEF would like to support those efforts by showing that we can help to advocate and coordinate with the different relevant ministries and agencies to make that happen in your different cities and countries. We also are very um, engaged in different levels of multi-sectoral collaboration. And we'd like to bring that to the table to try bring the various partners needed to, to make that happen. Because we know, even though we see this as a transport issue, there's so many more sectors that need to be engaged. And as UNICEF, we are very interested, of course, in making sure this is safe for children. We would like to ensure that through our engagement and, and support with you, that we are advocating and highlighting the needs and rights that children have to access and use these streets on a daily basis for their journeys, not just to and from school, but all those journeys they need to make and, and activities as they are going on their daily lives. So we are with you and we'd love to continue to support uh, the work and efforts that have happened today. So thank you for having us join and it's great to actually hear everyone speaking and, and on the right track, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Joanne. We're very happy to have UNICEF as part of the wider consortium for these activities. I'm now going to turn over to a video submission from our friends over at UNIP. Um, it will be due in just one. My name is Carly Gilbert Patrick, and I am the team leader for active mobility, digitalization, and mode integration at UNEP. We're delighted to join up with you and Habitat, UNICEF, ITDP, and other partners to deliver the Reclaiming Streets for Pedestrians and Cyclists in Africa project supported by the UN Road Safety Fund. Our mission at UNEP is to provide leadership and encourage partnership in caring for the environment by inspiring, informing, and enabling nations and people to improve their quality of life without compromising the quality of life for future generations. We support member states to ensure that environmental sustainability is reflected in development and investment decision making. In our transport work, this includes working in the areas of active mobility, mode integration, transport digitalization, as well as clean fuels and vehicles, used vehicles and electric mobility. In this project, we'll bring in our expertise in a few key areas, building networks towards a common cause. UNEP is the founder and lead agency of the Africa Network for Walking and Cycling, where we bring together over 50 organisations who are supporting active mobility in Africa, supporting governments to develop policies and systematically prioritise and allocate resources to walking and cycling infrastructure 
infrastructure and giving space in policy and planning processes to the voices of the most vulnerable. We'll use this expertise to support a few key areas, establishing regional exchange programmes on active mobility, policy infrastructure and advocacy to build capacity in the African region, and also strengthen collaboration with those financing infrastructure projects to really see that regional impact. We know we are in the midst of a triple planetary crisis spanning climate, nature and pollution. The science is crystal clear that we are putting extreme pressure on the planet. Now more than ever, we need to work in collaboration with partners with different agendas and different goals because there are so many connections. We know, for example, that if we can do better at improving road safety, we can have positive impacts for our planet too. There are challenging times ahead, but it's this type of collaborative approach that will help us achieve our road safety goals. And we're very happy and honoured to be part of this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll now hand over to Chris Cost for a brief um, comment as well. Chris, over to you. Thank you. Apologies for going so much over time, but um, I think everyone is, is very involved in the conversation, which is wonderful. Over to you. Hi, Janine. Thanks a lot. Um, it's great to be with everyone for this project, and, and we're really excited about the kickoff of, of the second phase project with you and RSF. We were also involved with the earlier phase that focused on Ethiopia and very much looking forward to being able to scale up those efforts in, in many more cities this time around. Um, so I, I just want to highlight what I think is the, the really critical issue that we need to address across the region. And, and that is that if, if we want to have uh, road safety and we want to tackle the, the severe challenges with road fatalities that all the speakers have been talking about, we have to change the way that our streets are designed. And the problem is that right now we're moving in the opposite direction in too many cases. We, we have many arterial streets in our cities that are being redesigned as limited access urban highways. Um, you know, stop signs are removed, stoplights are removed, uh, pedestrians are put up on footbridges. And this has predictable results where speeds go up, the, the streets become less accessible for children and people with disabilities. And, and in fact, for all pedestrians and cyclists, and even for public transport users. So we need to change this formula. We, we need to start designing safe urban streets to make sure that our major streets can carry the volumes that they need to, but to do so safely. And to ensure that we provide mobility through public transport um, for the longer trips and, and not by trying to just encourage faster speeds for cars. Um, one aspect that, that's new in this phase is the partnership with the, the uh, African Development Bank. So we're very excited to working about working with AFDB um, to see how we can really ensure that more of the finance is directed toward complete streets. Um, we, we have a, a lot of finance um, across the region still going into urban highways. And there's an opportunity now to, to redirect that money to make sure that it's going towards streets that are safe for all. Um, so with that, um, let me hand it back to Janine, but we're very excited about the partnership with uh, UNRSF, UN Habitat and all the other partners. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. And now we'll hand over to the head of the mobility section at UN Habitat for some closing remarks. Cecilia, Janine? over to you. Janine, one quick one. Yes, sure, hi, Steve. Yeah. Hi, sorry to interrupt before we close no. down. I think the, Af the African right, Development please. Bank, I think, might also be on the call. Maybe yes, I was advised that he, he had some meetings and might not be able to, to comment, but I will send another message um, just to double check. Uh, one moment. Sorry about that, Steph. Uh, Cecilia. <laughs> <laughs> one second. <laughs> one second for you. <laughs> I see Nechi online. I don't know if yes. he's able to unmute or speak or if he had to already go somewhere else. Yes, I had I had coordinated with him a few months ago and he indicated that he could be present in the session, but is not necessarily available to make remarks as he's in between meetings. So kind of listening to us in the okay. background. Well and good. Super. All right. Um, I have requested for him to speak and he, he has not unmuted the microphone. So 
perhaps we'll find another opportunity to get some feedback from Neji. But Neji, thank you for attending the session. I'm glad to have had you in the room throughout. Um, then I'll, I'll hand over to Cecilia then for the closing remarks. Thanks, Cecilia. Oh, thanks a lot, Janine. And, uh, and yeah, it actually has been such a pleasure to join you today for this launch of the UN Road Safety Fund project on reclaiming streets for pedestrians and cyclists in African cities. And thank you to all our fabulous speakers today. And as noted, we need to sort of build on this window of opportunity and the momentum where there is a political will to improve road safety especially for the most marginalized communities who make up the majority of the pedestrians and cyclists in African cities. So as we join hands uh, in the Im implementation of this project, we hope that this will accelerate efforts of governments and financiers, just as Steffi said, in you know, making local action and investments to design safer streets and create more livable public spaces. Uh, Stephanie highlighted as well how we are going to do this. So it's about policy advice, technical assistance, advocacy, city to city learning exchanges uh, on designing safer and more inclusive streets. So how are we going to go about this? It's about building and fostering that political will on the city level, uh, which Joanne actually brought up as a, as a key uh, ingredient for the success of this project. And I think the city of Kelimani and the uh, mayor who is the Bike, bicycling mayor really showed how important it is to be that champion. And, uh, and it's also about um, the willingness of local governments and local authorities uh, to bring in the needs of the communities and including them in the planning and design of safe walking and cycling infrastructure. And as, a, as highlighted by Mohamed Traoré, um, that local governments in Conakry have actually not included any walking or cycling infrastructure in their road developments. So how can we actually, you know, collect that data and inspire decision making and provide those opportunities for the co-creation and co-design of safe and inclusive streets? So, for example, Minecraft or conducting uh, walk, walking audits are a way of actually uh, getting that information and including people in those design in the co-design of those streets. It's also about building on and upscaling some of those wonderful initiatives that were highlighted today. Um, so for example, like in the city of Kigali where the streets are being reclaimed as car free and used for exercise as well as I love that picture of the restaurants and the cafes. But how can we actually replicate this on a citywide level and actually upscale to other cities as well? I also love that example about the, you know, that red carpet of walkways highlighting how important pedestrians are uh, in Mombasa and then how, they, how pedestrians are being prioritized. It's also about um, the capacity development as the mayor of Kelimani also talked about how can we actually support local government staff in, on the municipality level to have that technical knowledge and expertise to transform the city um, and in Kelimani, they were looking at the child-friendly city where children can bicycle safely uh, from home to school to play. And I think that's so important uh, is to provide those opportunities for learning uh, and exchange. It's also about developing uh, those guidelines and principles and design guidelines on how to create those um, safe and inclusive streets. Uh, as Michael King showed us, you know, the importance of for example, redesigning intersections and crossings in Dar es Salaam to make sure that schools, um, or to make sure that ch school children can cross safely on the street. It's all about in investment as well, and how can we actually redirect investment? Um, and Chris talked about that as well, you know, change the formula and redirect investment into creating complete streets and, and inclusive streets. It's about reviewing those policies and developing the frameworks and standards which can guide cities and local governments to improve safety as well, and being able to include um, the most vulnerable persons in our communities. And it's about supporting that exchange between cities. Uh, and Joanne alluded to that as well. You know, how important it is to exchange on good practices and solutions so that cities can learn from each other. But I think it's actually also about learning about the challenges and the failures sometimes as well. And finally, of course, none of this 
would have been possible without the partnerships. The partnerships of having all of you around the table coming together to implement this project, bringing together the knowledge, the tools, the solutions, the good practices that we can all build on. And as highlighted by, um, by Carly from UNEP, you know, that regional exchange component of the African network for walking and cycling can actually create that opportunity to synergize and join together in our efforts. Um, I would like to end here with my heartfelt gratitude actually to all the partners and speakers who have joined us today from all over the world and getting up early in the morning, Joanne, really appreciate that. And looking forward to working with you as we move on to reclaim streets for pedestrians and cyclists in African cities and ensuring that our children and women and people living in poor communities can enjoy walking and cycling safely in our cities. And as the UN Road Safety Fund campaign video highlighted, life is beautiful and we need to protect those moments for living. Thank you very much. And I hand over back to you, Janine. Cecilia, there is not much more I could say. You've really beautifully encapsulated the whole session and ended on such a fantastic note. So I will just say thank you again to those who attended and thank you for our translators who have made sure that the session was listened to in multiple languages and um, all of the officials who joined us as well. Thank you very much and we look forward to working with you. Thank you.